Alrighty, well, hello everyone. Welcome back. It is I, it's me, it's Jackson Wheat, and also my one of my favorite guests is the Dapper Dinosaur. Welcome. I'm so much of a favorite guest that I'm still not on the on the intro. Dang. <laughs> Start right off with a burn. Oof. Uh, <laughs> retired, I guess. Uh, yeah, early retirement. Early Send retirement. Send condolences to Jackson. <laughs> to, to be fair, if if you want to be on the intro, you might start complaining to me instead of to Jackson. That's true. Peter is the one who oversees <laughs> the technical aspects. But then I can't make that joke every time. Peter, that, do it. That is true. Knee, kneecap him. That is true. All right. Uh, so we know you guys loved our last series so much. And actually, in terms of views for our live stream, it did very well on my channel. Um, I bring so in the that, views. That's true. You absolutely do. Uh, you probably passed me up in in subscribers by now. Uh, um, so have I? I have no idea, but I assume no. so. At any rate, uh, so Dapper does. He's got that that top hat and the monocle, and everyone loves dinosaurs. So everyone likes looking fancy, and everyone likes dinosaurs. So what's not to love? Uh, it, it, there's nothing not to love. Exactly. So the last series that we did was on the process of and the evidence for evolution. And I think that went pretty well. Overall, we covered, um, you know, most of the sort of bare bones of evolution. We didn't get into the... Do what? I was going to say, it was like evolutionary biology, like 101, yeah. crammed into like, what was it, like eight hours? I think it was, yeah, I think it was six hours because it was six just hours? videos. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so the basics of evolution, an entire class just crammed into six hours. So you're welcome. You can save that money. Don't go to college. No need. <laughs> um, I disagree with this advice. <laughs> you, you may want to go to college if you desire to be a professional in any field involving Fair evolutionary enough. biology. Fair Although, enough, I guess. Technically, there are no degree requirements to submit and have pu papers published, but it helps. That's true. Yeah, that, that is true. And also, if you are planning on submitting a paper, don't say that you got an okay from said paper, <laughs> put their trademark on it, and then lie that that happened. Yeah, that's what we in the biz call academic fraud. <laughs> yeah, and if you commit that, you pretty much have no standing in the academic community ever again at that point. Mm -mm. So. Even if you later do good work, no one cares. There, there's there's very little forgiveness in academia. Yeah. Yep, exactly right. But, uh, so today I think we're here to talk about, what, the first 80% or so of Earth's history? Yeah, so, all right, here's the here's the thing, everybody. We, uh, in the same way that we had slides for the evidence uh, for evolution, we have made up a slideshow of the history of life on Earth and geology, etc. And that, we're calling this natural history. So... Uh, we're basically going to cover about mm, yeah eighty percent or so of the Earth's history. We may get through all of the first PowerPoint today. It's not very long <laughs> because neither of us are geologists, and so we're going to be focusing predominantly on the the biota, which didn't even show up until about five hundred to seven hundred million years after the Earth had uh, coalesced. So there's a little bit of time there. And also a True. lot of chemistry involved in all this sort of stuff. And microbiology. Microbes are, are sort of the... Um, they were in charge for most of Earth's history. I mean, I, there's still the majority of the biomass on the planet. And that's true. Yeah, there's... I think the first macroscopic organisms appeared at the start of the Ediacaran, which was about 635 million years ago. So... And then you have your the Cambrian explosion about 540 million years ago, which we'll get to, of course. So 
Yeah, and bear in mind, life started somewhere between 3.8 and 4 billion years ago. So from about 4 billion years to about 635 million years ago. Yep, and which is one of the reasons why... Microbial life. <laughs> I hate it when people compare modern microbes to what they imagine the first life would have to be like. Because, like, look, man, by the time you get to anything that's recognizable as a modern group of microbes, you've already gone through, you know, like, 3 billion years of evolution. Yeah. A lot can change in that time. Bent Hoven, no relation, asks, the Precambrian, is that before the Cambrian? And guess what? You're correct. The Precambrian... And then there's the post-Cambrian, which is not really a term anyone uses, but it's okay. We could just start using it. We could. I suppose we could. I don't... Post, Post-Cambrian is pretty much pre-flood. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, there. All right. Uh, let's jump right in, Peter. The Precambrian. da 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 da, da. It's not even really fair to use this as a term because it encompasses multiple like eons, which are longer than the Phanerozoic. So <laughs> it's it's just a useful term that which you know probably which I think originated before anyone had any idea how long before the Cambrian was. It's kind of like CE, right? The Common Era, right? That's pretty short compared to the whole span of human history. Who cares? We're just gonna go with it. Yep, it's just a in the same just like species puts on heretic hat. Uh, Precambrian is just a useful construct. <laughs> Takes it off. All right, okay, getting spicy already. Let's let's go to the first one. Is that still a spicy take? I don't. I mean, no, probably not. Okay, but uh, anyways, okay. So as said, uh, we're not geologists or. I, I don't know. What would it be? Astronomers? What, I'm not an astronomer or a geologist. Yep. No, yeah, I'm also not technically a biologist either. So, you know. I guess also technically I am not yet. At least I would not consider myself one yet because I'm not actively contributing to the field. So I would not consider myself a biologist. I'm a biology enthusiast. There you go. That's a good That's a good point. Um, so our so the the theory as near as I can understand it currently is that our solar system and that includes our earth uh, coalesced from a pre-existing nebula about 4.6 billion years ago um not much I can really say about that that's what I understand and the earth had cooled enough because the earth was very hot um you know when you have mm -hmm. lots of of these different uh, bolides all you know smashing into each other that creates heat lots and lots of heat <laughs> yes it and does so, and also so, just the initial collapse is going to cause a lot of heat because you're taking potential energy converting it to kinetic energy as those things come towards the center but then when they actually coalesce at the center that kinetic energy then has to turn into thermal energy so mm -hmm. earth basically starts well above the melting point for iron right yeah exactly so very very hot and so as you can see it took another uh, 200 million years for the earth to have cooled enough for liquid water to exist on our planet that's uh that's quite a while think about that to, if to put it in perspective 200 million years ago was in the jurassic you know from today mm -hmm. so stegosaurus i don't even think stegosaurus was around yet he was like late jurassic right so that was um yeah but i honestly don't know when like this the taxon arrives on the scene like what year sorry fair enough um but still like you know that's a long time that's before flowers before birds it's a long <laughs> before flowers um yeah. it's actually questionably before birds it count, depends on what you count as a bird okay because birds kind of arise in the mid jurassic but like hmm. are they crown birds what what does does bird mean crown bird like eh, okay. you know yeah so there, there were flying feathery things but they probably would not have been something that you would recognize as any modern bird uh, group. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, suffice it to say 200 million years is a long time. Yes. It's it's much longer ago than, say, George Washington. <laughs> Only marginally. Yeah. <laughs> a few orders of magnitude. <laughs> what's, what's a few zeros between friends, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, compared to some of the people we deal with, not much apparently. I, fair enough. Fair enough. 
Um, and as the Earth was um, substantially warmer than it is now, um, it also makes sense that the composition of the atmosphere was different. But also, you know, there there weren't biological processes yet that were contributing to the composition of the atmosphere either. And we'll, we'll get into that, uh, I think, in a few slides from now. But the point is essentially that uh, the early Earth's atmosphere was composed of a number of compounds which exist in only very minute quantities in our current atmosphere due to a variety of processes. So that's hydrogen sulfide, methane, and carbon dioxide uh, were, the, were the main ones. So the atmosphere was primarily reducing at the very beginning. Um, it doesn't seem to have been... Uh, the, the original uh, hypotheses about the origin of life was that like the atmosphere was reducing when life came on the scene, and that was the um, the Operin, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Operin, well, he was one of the guys. Operin uh, Haldane? I think it was. I think it was Operin Haldane. I think you're right. Uh, okay. They proposed that back in the early 1900s. Um, Darwin didn't really care about what was going on with abiogenesis. He was just kind of like, yeah, you probably had like, you know, a warm pond and some some phosphorus and salts and things like that. And that probably gave, you know, was involved in the origin of life, but he wasn't super concerned with it. He really didn't write much of anything about it. And so it wasn't for another, you know, uh, he died in what the 1880s. So it wasn't for another like 40 or so years before anyone was really sort of uh, trying to figure out what the early earth's atmosphere was like and how this would have contributed to the origin of life. And then uh, using the, Oper and Haldane um, hypothesis. You had the Miller-Urey experiment, which is very well known, which happened in, I believe, was the 50s, right? Uh, I do believe that is correct, although I, I would... It, before you write this on a test at school or something, Google it. <laughs> Don't take our word yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so you had the, the Miller-Urey experiment, which generated a few uh, amino acid um, compounds, and you know, some other organic molecules. And that was really neat. That is in no way, shape, or form the state of the field nowadays. So uh, No, in the, what, 70 years since then, we've <laughs> right. made some progress? <laughs> right. And it's it's really funny because there is a, a certain guy going around who is claiming that that's it, who is a, a an organic chemist, a synthetic organic chemist, who is apparently claiming that that's the only experiment that's ever been done in the field. That was yeah. it 70 years ago. So that's a little weird. But anyway, um, as you can see, there was so there was a lot of water vapor and there was there was a lot more carbon dioxide than there is today. Carbon dioxide. It's like less than one percent of the atmosphere now, isn't it? Something like that. Yes. It's, yeah, it's, it's a very it's, small percent. <laughs> if I remember correctly, it's currently measured in like parts per billion or something. Yeah. So which, which also, also means, by the way, that any amount that you add is actually fairly significant. Because it's already such a low amount. Hmm. Weird. Strange. Yeah. Very weird. Uh, and so there was a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the past, uh, much more so than today. Uh, there was not oh, a lot sorry, of free parts oxygen. per million. Michael Apple corrected me on that when I was wrong about billion. Parts uh, per million. Thank you. Uh, who all do we have in here? Hello, everybody. Oh, Dessel Drace, uh, Michael Apple, Michael Apple, sorry, Kappa 1611. We got Smitty. We got uh, Paleologos is here. We got uh, Professor Flynn, Bent Hovind, Vandalia is here. I think that sums it up. Yes. Welcome, everyone. Glad to see everybody. What, what did they say? What was the... Um... Carbon dioxide. It was a thing. Oh, was there, was, uh, fortunately, yeah, we don't have as much of it now as there used to be. Yeah. Was there land during the Hadean? I don't remember. I well, know it, at it first it would have been all land. Right. But I mean, when, yeah, there was all land. And then when it allowed for, uh, when, when the earth was cool enough for water to form, I believe it was all like one continuous ocean. And then you had the first tectonic plates arising later. Uh, but I don't remember. I think there's a PBS Eons video on that. So uh, <clears throat> I'll give you a controversial paper that argues otherwise. Uh, 
this is just a chart. This is the chart that I found that is. Oh, well, thank you, Michael Apple, for uh, for five dollars. Appreciate it. Uh, this is just the chart that you typically find associated with um, atmospheric uh, change throughout Earth's history. Uh, is this probably exactly correct? Uh, probably not. But I think it suffices for our purposes. Yeah. So at any rate, uh, anything to add, Dapper? Um. No, I, I think we're we're pretty good. Um, we'll probably, when we get later into this, talk more about the rise of auction during the yes. Proto-Rozoic. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, pulls. All right. The Origin of Life. Uh, there's a book on the origin of life that I read a while back. Uh, it's titled The Vital Questions by Nick Lane. He's a biochemist. Um a really interesting book um, because the 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 sort of uh, I don't want to say dumbed down. It's it's the I guess the sort of it's the for lay audiences. Yeah, book. for lay audience uh, picture that you get is kind of the like you know the black smoker, which are the um, the hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean, and it's like life probably originated around you know the hydrothermal vents. Um, well, there are different types of hydrothermal vents, which I mean, yeah, makes sense. And the the one that was originally thought to be the the place where life possibly originated, they're called black smokers. They give off this, this deep uh, colored smoke, which contains lots and lots of different um, minerals and molecules and all sorts of stuff in it. And the thinking was, well, maybe because it's giving off such this such a mixture, maybe this is this contributed to the origin of life well maybe but it seems that researchers have kind of moved away from that and more towards what are called alkaline hydrothermal vents so rather than giving off these these big combinations of molecules they're giving off this very basic water alkaline refers to the um the was it the second column of elements right well, so it has to do with whether what kinds of uh, ions you're giving off in solution with right. water, whether you're donating right. protons or receiving them. Uh. <laughs> but there's the alkali metals, but I don't. There are things that are alkaline that aren't the alkali metals. Okay, gotcha. Um, but in these vents, you have so the uh, the water coming out of these vents is like full of hydroxides, which is um, very basic. And or I guess it would be hydroxyls. It's almost as basic of... as Jason as Jackson wheat. Almost as basic. <laughs> Slightly more acidic, right? <laughs> uh, and as these are being given off, the the thinking is that since there was greater there was a greater amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, this would have dissolved at greater rates into the ocean, which also today uh, ha impacts us and terms of ocean acidification it still uh, you know still dissolves in the ocean and uh, contributes to the decalcification of corals and sponges and mollusks and things like that which is not great not no. great at all especially if you rely on some of these organisms for food that imagine really being great. unable to grow your skeleton because there just isn't enough calcium that you can absorb yeah you might get this, this thing I think it's called rickets <laughs> it's really, really bad. Yeah. Slug rickets or snail rickets. <laughs> I mean, I doubt that the symptoms are exactly the same, but I imagine they're similarly severe. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, because with corals, you know, when they're under like thermal uh and acidity stress, they they bleach, they essentially expel their algae and they die. And that's not great. That's not great, especially when fish, which are uh, fished for food tend to live in coral reefs or around coral reefs, or at least spend part of their life cycle in coral reefs. So then that's really not great. Correct. Um, but so the idea is you have these, these natural proton gradients. You have minerals which catalyze the reaction between these uh, the, between the, the like carbon dioxide and the 
that's dissolved in the ocean, and uh, the 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 hyd hydroxyls which are coming out of these vents, and you can catalyze the formation of organic molecules. And so, this the uh, the simplest organic molecule is is methane, right? Uh, CH four, isn't it? It's just one carbon with four hydrogens. I am not a chemist. I was but, very bad at chemistry in school. Well, you also get um, your carbohydrates are C uh, H O. It's like it's in the name. Yeah. Uh, no, we're not going to tell the story. Uh, <laughs> anyways, it's too dumb. Uh, so, or I believe it's C H two O. Sorry, not C H O. Um, but then you can, you know, get you can add as many carbon and hydrogens and oxygen as you want and generate these really really long um, carbohydrates, which have different functions and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so basically, all of our, all of our, you know, necessary um, organic molecules are found like in and around these vents. And the thinking is that maybe this contributed in some way to the origin of life, which entirely possible. Uh, as I said, not a chemist, but that doesn't seem super wild to me. The fact that we are able to so easily find organic molecules in space seems that. The production of organic molecules is relatively easy. I would be willing to bet, though, that the actual origin of life itself is probably relatively difficult to accomplish. But at its core, um, life is really just about, what is it, maintaining a thermodynamic equilibrium with your environment? Disequilibrium. Dis disequilibrium, sorry, yeah. Thermodynamic disequilibrium with your uh, environment, and that's... That's basically uh, what it is to okay. be alive, is you are maintaining a thermodynamic disequilibrium by using energy gradients in your environment to conduct like biological processes. When that breaks down and you can no longer maintain thermodynamic disequilibrium, there is no more energy gradient for you to exploit. You have reached thermal e equilibrium with your environment. Therefore, you cannot conduct any of the life processes that require energy, and so you're not alive because that's what life basically is, is it's the system that conducts these processes. Once it can't do them, that's it. So at, mm. if you want to get super reductive about it, life is just a self-sustaining uh, chemical set, series of chemical reactions that maintain an energy gradient with the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dessel Drace uh, points out um, also, along with cobalt, tungsten, nickel, and several others. Yeah, exactly right. So, yep, lots of different metals involved. Uh, mm -mm -mm. Yep, yeah, you, you are correct, uh, Dessel, but as said, neither of us are chemists, so... <laughs> but we appreciate the, uh, the input. Um, all right, next slide, please. And here's just a series of different uh, reactions that, you know, that go from like, uh, it says inorganic molecules to organic precursors to your building blocks and functional polymers and ultimately to earliest life. Because it would have been a gradient, right? None of this was, you had some, or, some inorganic molecules and then boom, bacteria. That didn't happen. You would have had a series of steps uh, you know, probably occurring through a variety of processes, which ultimately ended up at what we would consider living, right? And at what point do you consider like replicating molecules living, right? There's a lot of debate over that, uh, because you also have things like viruses, for instance, which replicate when inside a host, but are they living? Well. I mean, they do lifelike things under certain circumstances, but not under others. And what about, uh, like, satellite DNA, you know, DNA which just uh, replicates on its own, or prions, which are just proteins. It, there's not even any DNA involved. At what point do we consider things living? And the, the argument or the, the response to that is sometimes, oh, well, if they, 
you know, live independently of something else. Well, the problem with that is there are bacteria that are totally dependent on host cells like uh, chlamydia, for instance. So that's not really a good response. Which infect a ridiculous proportion of koalas. True. Very true. Um, koalas got the this, clap, man. I s skip entirely in a publication or spend two hours trying to trace every pathway. Well, it's I mean, it's on the internet, so where can you find this chart? Uh, I don't remember where this particular chart came from. Uh, if you search maybe uh, abiogenesis chemical pathways or something to that effect, you probably be able to find it. I don't quite remember where this came from, but at any rate, next slide, please. And then, you know, same sort of process going from yeah, atoms, molecules, macromolecules, polymers, protocells to full cells. And you have your, your this, these processes are occurring along inorganic um, surfaces at first, and which ultimately uh, would have been replaced with organic, yeah, with organic membranes. So just kind of reinforcing that. Next slide, please. Jackson, as as the producer, yes. um, if Paleologos wants to have that chart and you have that as a, as a picture, I'm more than happy to be a real producer. Yeah, no, you can and, send it to him and make sure yeah. that he that he gets it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I I don't remember. I don't remember where I got it. I apologize, but yeah, feel free to hand it out to whoever wants it. No problem. Okay. Uh, I don't uh, copyright or own any of these things. These are just pictures I got from the internet. Some of them come from technical papers. Some of them, I just went to Google Images and they work well enough. <laughs> so, uh, Luca was the last universal common ancestor. So the first cell and Luca were not the same thing. Probably. Very likely. Yeah, probably not. Um, Luca uh refers... Go ahead, Dapper. I was going to say, I, I've, there are actually hypotheses for the first cellular life either post-dating or predating Luca. Very interesting. Yeah. But I yeah. tend to think that predate seems pretty likely since, you know, all extant life has pretty similar uh, cellular membranes. Right. But I mean, I'm willing to entertain the other option that um, more than one line of life developed, you know, what we think of as cellularity after Luca. Yeah, I, I know um, because that works for some things like the uh, transcription uh, enzymes uh, evolved differently in bacteria and archaea, but meaning ultimately eukarya also. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so some things evolved in in uh, you know, separately in, in both because uh, there are ideas like the that Luca was a ribosome uh, genome or had a ribosome genome rather than a uh, a DNA genome, and so that you know, quote the well, the the enzymes involved evolved thereafter. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also likely a population where members were exchanging genetic material amongst themselves rather than um, one individual, which is you know more the case when we get to like common ancestry between like animals or plants or fungi, something like that. So, at this point, you're yeah, probably not one individual. <laughs> Or possibly not. Yeah, I, I doubt that it would be one individual. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so prokaryotic world. So life, well, the first life would have been in this in would have been prokaryotic in the sense of it just didn't have a nucleus. But Dapper, entertain them for a moment, please. Well, everybody, so, <clears throat> yeah, like Jackson was saying, for the first two to, uh, sorry, well, yeah, four to two billion years ago, um, life was what we would call prokaryotic. Um, prokaryotic is sort of a grade and not, it's not like it's a clade because eukaryotes nest within a clade that also includes prokaryotes. But basically, they didn't have a nucleus. Um, when we say it was almost entirely unicellular, we do get some colonial things that may have had some kind of division of labor among cells, which would make them sort of in the in-between stage between unicellular and multicellular, but 
we're still primarily talking about either independent living single cells or colonies of single cells. Um, so <clears throat> uh, stromatolites, which by the way, you can still see being formed today in um, Australia, are some of the earliest fossils that we get. And they, we get them going back billions of years. And these are columns of photosynthetic algae that are not, well, bacteria, that, which is a kind, these are a kind of algae, whatever, that sort of grow as time goes on. So you get a layer of this bacterial film, and then as it reproduces, the newer bacteria start going up because that's the direction they can grow. The lower down bacteria end up dying, and the intercellular matrix that they were exuding to help stay in place kind of solidifies and becomes part of the rock, basically. And so this is some of our earliest evidence of life at all. But also there are possible bacterial fossils. Like we have this one in the lower left hand. <clears throat> that's yes. about 3.5 billion years old. Now, is it definitely a bacterial fossil? No. I'm glad you pointed that out, actually. <laughs> yeah. But it is. <laughs> There's a it, bit of debate over that. <laughs> it's consistent with what we might expect for a string of bacteria. Because some uh, bacteria form these filaments where they just connect end to end. And uh, they do it for various reasons. Um, a lot of photosynthetic bacteria will do that. It helps them, you know, keep their place in the water column and things like that. And uh, they can also share resources that way. So um, uh, Brainbug asks, uh, were these phototrophic? So um, as far as the potential bacteria on the left, who knows, maybe. But as far as stromatolites, yes. Uh, yeah, the, the cool thing about that, so... I put possible there because uh, William Schopf, I think is how you pronounce it, it's like S C H O P F, uh, was the was the one who found well and a team found those possible bacterial fossils and I mean I have no problem with them being bacterial fossils that would certainly fit in with like the 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 known evolutionary history of this group. Yeah, it doesn't right? break anything for them to be fall for that to be a fossil. It's just yeah, the data doesn't quite support that as a firm conclusion yeah it could be some uh a a bio or abiotic um you know, like minerals or something like that which just happen to sort of look like it it because it, remember these are these are microscopic i mean look at that it says 10 micrometers yeah these are very right? very tiny very very small you're not seeing these with the naked eye they're probably you know pouring over these rocks under a, a big microscope and they happen to see that and be like oh what's that you know <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, yeah, and also almost entirely unicellular. Yeah, you're right. Uh, like, what does it mean to even be multicellular? Because cyan or, yeah, cyanobacteria like Nostoc and Anabena, um, they do things that look sort of multicellular e. I go with a uh, cell um, differentiation on the basis of division of labor. So yeah. if you have more than one, um, basically like expression of the genotype of the same more than one expression of the same genotype in a collection of cells. And those differences in expression are the result of adaptations to different function, especially with reproduction being a single set of function set aside to a particular group of cells. Mm -hmm. That's when I say that it has gone from being colonial to multicellular for me. That's what I use. I think that oh, yeah, makes, means that all the things that everyone agrees are multicellular, they all fit that bill. And then, the stuff that everyone agrees isn't multicellular doesn't. And so I think it's a fair definition. Um, but hey, you know what? I don't get to decide that. But I I, I don't know. It's what I go with. I mean, I, I, I didn't agree with that. I mean, because, you know, you have guys like, like Anabena, where they have a cell which just fixes nitrogen while everyone else is still doing photosynthesis, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, okay, well, you know, it's, this is a line of clones, but one of them is doing something that the rest of them aren't doing. Yeah. So is that multicellularity? Well, maybe. I'm going to go, if that's a maybe, but once they have a group of cells that are just there to reproduce, then it's a yes. Yeah. yeah and same, I think, uh, for actinomyces, which were originally accidentally misidentified as fungi, hence actinomyces, that mm -hmm. refers to their fungi, uh, that refers to fungi. And so, but they're a group of bacteria. They're not fungi at all, but they kind of look like uh, I think it's mycelia. And so there's a little bit of confusion over that. So, you know, th it, it also makes sense that there would be this gradient of of organisms. You know, some are definitely unicellular, you know, and some are definitely multicellular. And then if 
there were these transitions from one to the other. And in fact, there there are transitions in both directions, funny enough. Yep. Uh, it's almost the, like what you might expect if evolution were true. Right. Yeah, exactly. This is yeah what you would expect if evolution were true. Yeah. Things that are sort of kind of halfway, partway between two different things. So anyway, anything else? Are we ready? I think we're ready. All right. Next slide, please. Uh, just more on the uh, last universal common ancestor. This was a recent paper. I don't know what I was thinking because with the evolution PowerPoint, and I put my sources with everything. I don't know why I screwed up so badly on this one. My apologies, audience. Uh, but this was a recent paper uh, where they were arguing you can basically divide um, bacteria into three groups, and so uh, so you got. That's right, yeah. So, Gracilicutes ter and Terabacteria and Fusobacteria, which is um, basically derived with respect to both. Um, Terabacteria includes the Firmicutes and Cyanobacteria. So, for reference, Firmicutes are the gram positive bacteria. Well, <laughs> for Most reference, gram positive. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, a bunch of them. Um, so, for reference, uh, if you take a microbiology class, for instance, you're going to come across these terms that are gram positive positive and gram negative so most bacteria are gram negative and some of them are gram positive now that refers to their their membranes so gram negatives typically have like this one uh membrane and then gram positives have these like these big double membranes right isn't that it oh no they have a lot of peptidoglycan in there that's actually membrane. something you should ask Benthoven about he knows more about that than i do yeah, I believe it's they have they have a lot of their or not their membrane, their cell wall. Sorry, sorry, my bad. I meant cell wall, not that's not cell membrane. Um, and the cell wall is composed of peptidoglycan, and so when you are doing your gram stain, uh, they turn different colors. You use these different uh, these different stains, and you can be like, okay, well, you know, this one's purple. Uh, and then if it's gram positive and this one's like red, if it's gram negative, because they don't absorb the, 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 um, the stain that you're putting on them. And so that's, you can differentiate them based on that first. And then you can subject them to all sorts of tests about like, uh, you know, do they make a particular enzyme? Do they have a particular metabolic pathway? All that sorts of fun stuff. So anyway, uh, yep, horizontal gene transfer is common among bacteria, and so that's kind of why there it's it's difficult to make a, a single phylogeny of bacteria uh, because you can have this thing called what is it the the hologenome, I believe it is, where it's like you have what the bacteria in this what you can find with it in the bacteria in this group, but that's not all the genes the bacteria in this group may have. Right, and the reason is that they get genes from other bacteria, or even from viruses, or they pick up from the environment, things like bacteria that. Bacteria are great at horizontal gene transfer. They are. They do a whole lot of it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Both absorb the stain. Gram positive just don't easily get the stain washed out. That's right. Correct. Let me put that up here. Uh, according to, yeah, KH says both absorb the stain. Gram positive just don't easily get the stain washed out during the ethanol step because of the cell wall. Exactly. The ethanol step is my favorite step. <laughs> yeah. Black queen hypothesis. I'm not sure what that is. I've heard of the red queen hypothesis. But that's a new one on me. Okay. Uh, anything to add, Dapper? No. Okay, next slide. I mean, I'm please. sorry, you did a good job covering that, Jackson. Oh, thanks. So kind. Okay, so I know thus far we haven't really talked about. Uh, we've go we've gone now about two billion years into you know, the evolution of life on Earth, and we haven't even touched on like Archaea. Sorry, we'll get to them in a moment. So, uh, yeah, so the great oxygenation event. So this is when we start to see appreciable levels of oxygen. Uh, 
in the ocean and then which outgassed to the atmosphere. Now, not nearly as much as there is in the atmosphere today. We're talking going from like, you know, parts per million to, you know, 20 ish percent. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, we, we're not going all the way. Uh, as you guys saw in that chart at the beginning, it was like a slow rise at first, and then it really went up later. And that really big sort of pulse in oxygen uh, didn't occur until I believe like around the Cambrian, which has also contributed to some hypotheses about uh, predation and raising the size limit of organisms, uh, which again, we'll, we'll get to that later, uh, probably next week. Uh, so the ancestors of cyanobacteria utilized electrons taken from reduced manganese, and they oxidized the manganese to perform photosynthesis. Uh, other bacteria already do this with, uh, yeah, with, with iron, hydrogen sulfide, and organic carbon. And so the evidence of this is found in oxidized manganese deposits dating to 2.4 billion years ago. So yeah, so while we don't have a fossil record of photosynthesis, because this is a metabolic pathway and thus very, very unlikely to be fossilized. Uh, researchers can make, you know, uh, predictions about what should be found if this evolved from a prior metabolic pathway. And indeed, the fact that there are that there is um, oxidized manganese before a jump in oxygen indicates that the bacteria, probably the ancestors of cyanobacteria, were using this. And then they went a few more steps and developed that photosynthetic pathway. And then we're really cranking out oxygen. Right. And so by 2.1 billion years ago, cyanobacteria had evolved oxygenic photosynthesis, pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. And the evidence of this is from what are called abandoned iron formations. And there's a little picture of one <laughs> down there on the bottom. So these, these formations have iron in them, and they rusted. Because that's what happens when mm -hmm. you get oxygen and iron in a room together. You get rust. Right, because it's iron oxide. Yep. Um, anything you'd like to add? Um, oxidation happens to your fruit, but that doesn't mean you can't eat anymore. It just looks a little <laughs> different. So when you get all those brown spots on apples or, or uh, bananas, it, that, that's okay. That's apples after you cut them, you know. If there's a big brown mushy spot, then maybe it's not okay. But, you know, just saying, oxidation, it's a thing. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, Dessel Drace says, I guess referring to the, the Black Queen hypothesis, it's an attempt to... Ex to is that supposed to be examined? Trends of reductive evolution of bacteria... Lane gives some alternative answers in his book, Power, Sex, and Suicide. Well, I'll add that to the list, I guess. Yay, reading One recommendations. One book to add to the Amazon wish list. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Desil Drace. Um, okay. All righty. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, also, Bent Hoven says, um, I trust me infinitely more times than Uncle Kent. No relation. <laughs> fair enough i guess that's very fair yeah um so so here you go uh you have your the great oxygenation event so you get a big jump and look at that yeah it, we're not even up to, yeah uh to present atmospheric level so you get a really big jump uh around 2.1 or so billion years ago and but it's still not up to today in terms of oxygen then you get it says overshooting so oxygen levels actually went back down apparently and then they sort of stabilized for a while a period known as the, the boring billion which we'll talk about momentarily and then you get another raise right around the start of the cambrian and then it sort of goes up to to modern levels from there so just sort of an overview of that process Anything you'd like to add? Um, we may get into it later, but uh, at first, this oxidation was not great for life because uh, oxygen is actually pretty bad for life overall. The only reason mm -hmm. that it's so important for, say, you, aer you know, aerobic organisms, you know, like me and you and whatnot, 
is because uh, there mm-hmm. have been some heavy adaptations to allow it to you to allow life to use it to basically more efficiently break down some molecules to get the energy. But it's still very damaging to things like DNA and all sorts of other biomolecules who will break down when they're oxidized. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, when oxygen first came around, it was extremely toxic to basically everything. Yeah, and you still, uh, there are still lots of things that, uh, you know, incorporate oxygen, which harm your cells, like uh, peroxide, hydroxyl mm-hmm. uh, radicals, uh, superoxide, all that fun stuff, which um, which can damage your, your cells and your DNA. And so you have to have uh, peroxisomes come around and, and sort of nip those in the bud. Yeah. And DNA repair mechanisms and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, also, it's still that's why... toxic, even though... Oh, yeah. right. I was going to say, that's why ozone therapy is one of the stupidest things imaginable. What is, oh God, I'm afraid to ask, what is ozone therapy? Oh, it's people doing things like um, huffing ozone or dissolving ozone into a liquid and then taking it intravenously. Huh. It's extremely dangerous. Don't We've do it. We've been around for far too long, I'm uh-huh. convinced. Yeah. So what, oh, this is a bit of a tangent, but what ozone likes to do is it just likes to rip apart carbon, 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 carbon bonds. Any carbon carbon bonds around? Well, not after ozone. Um, <laughs> guess what a lot of you was made of? <laughs> Is it carbon bonds? Yeah, it's carbon carbon bonds. So, oh my goodness. Ozone in high concentrations basically just dissolves your your the molecules making up your cells and turns them into a soup. If you ever want to see what it does to you, you can take some ozone and spray it on a um, like a, a latex glove because latex is also mostly carbon carbon bonds. Hmm. It just frays apart into nothing. That's what we call a yikes. Maybe yeah. a yowza. And yet it's being promoted by, you know, medical woo practitioners as the next greatest thing because it's going to attack all the bad stuff in your body, which is true. I it mean, will that, attack that is all the true. Bad stuff. <laughs> it's just that it will attack the rest of you too. It's just like, hey, in a laboratory setting, flamethrowers have been known to kill cancer. Correct. I, they're not wrong, I guess. <laughs> if you, if you, uh, Eat those, uh, those, what is it like the cyanide pills that Hoven was, oh, was talking? Yeah, you know, you'll never have any problems again, I guarantee. Yeah, so. take enough of them. You definitely won't have cancer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Anyways, next slide, please. Oh, by the way, I just did a video about uh, Kent Hoven where he said, Imagine putting something toxic inside of your body while talking about vaccines. This from the man who was like, Just eat a bunch of cyanide, it'll be fine. <laughs> oh no and also Absolutely also not. the man who famously said that vitamins is an abbreviation of vital minerals so oh, goodness <laughs> <laughs> oh man is there anything he won't screw up no it, you know we're not here to talk about him <laughs> uncle kent can wait until that's also like a high school teacher for, for 15 time. years no. Anyways, uh, the origin of eukarya. So we have promptly dashed through about two billion years of the history of life on Earth. Sorry about that, folks. That's all right. Um, and here we are. Uh, at a, somewhere between, I think it's like 1.8 and 2 billion years ago is when the origin of eukaryotes is hypothesized to have occurred. And and yeah, I said popular uh, the the it is probably the most well evidenced uh, hypothesis. That's why it's the most popular. That's how t- things tend to work in science. Things are gain popularity when they are evidenced. You know, that's how that works. Uh, as opposed to social media. Anyway, so the idea broadly is that a an Archaean whom we haven't really talked about. Uh, Archaea is the other um, mega clade of life basically you have of extant life you have bacteria and then archaea and eukarya branches within archaea and i'll actually show a phylogeny for that in like the next slide or the next something like that uh which was also a surprise because for a long t- well it was thought essentially archaea were discovered to be separate from bacteria in the 80s i think and then once they were discovered to be something different it seemed like it always seemed like archaea were closer to eukaryotes but it wasn't until later that it turned out eukaryotes are actually a subset of archaea. 
there are cans that engulfed a bacterium which seems to be either in or near the alpha proteobacteria, which is one of the phyla of bacteria, which is one phylum of bacteria. And so that alpha proteobacterium, uh, it, is, it is thought, uh, ev evolved into our mitochondria. And so this relationship drove the evolution of the cell nucleus, uh, other organelles, and possibly even sexual reproduction. And... Uh, and another endosymbiotic event uh, occurred in the ancestor of, of plants, Archaeplastida, so the red algae, green algae, all those guys, uh, which became the, which uh, was a cyanobacteria. And then that, that second endosymbiotic event, it gave rise to all the, the photosynthetic red algae and green algae. And then some green algae and red algae were then taken in by other eukaryotes. And then you have like endosymbioses within endosymbioses within endosymbioses. It gets really wild <laughs> because protists are like, hey, can I use this to make food? Absolutely. I think I will. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you get like these little Matryoshka dolls. And some of them, uh, very interestingly, still have the remnants of the nucleus within their degenerate uh, green or red algae it's called a uh, nucleomorph if i remember correctly and uh organelles don't really need a nucleus so that seems pretty good evidence that this was a a uh, another endosymbiotic event also there are things like the the fact that the the chloroplast in plants and you know mitochondria in in all eukaryotes uh have like a double membrane and that is uh, or the reason for that is the inner membrane is the mitochondrial or is is the the bacterial membrane and the outer membrane is one that came from the eukaryote later anything you'd like to add no i think you covered it very well okay all righty okay next slide please so here we go. Here's a phylogeny of, you got archaea. So you have bacteria way down there. They're the out group. And then from within the, the uh, archaeans, eukarya branches out. And we, it, uh, in recent years, there is this group of archaeans that has been discovered called the Loki archaeota, which come from an area up near, uh, I think it's like Iceland. They That's fight the name. Thor archaeota. I think Thor Archaeota is actually one of the uh, one of the genera. It's like I think it's Thor, Loki, Odin, and Heimdall. Uh, and each one's like Thor Archaeota, Loki Archaeota, etc. They went all out. <laughs> I approve. <laughs> and so they appear to be our the closest um, prokaryotic relatives of Eukarya. They have some you know, enzymes and other components which are more similar to eukaryotes than to other. Archaeans. So. All right. Next slide, please. And then here it is. Um, more uh, fleshed out. And then, you know, feel free to read that. So you have your Archaean, which is that guy with the, um, the, the, it's got like the blue and the gray. And then the, the red there is the, the uh, pre-mitochondrian, in a sense. And again, we're not chemists. I'm not an organic chemist, and so I'm not really going to go into all the details on that. But uh, anything to add, Dapper? Um, nothing related to this, but apparently uh, at one point, someone reported me for changing the colors of my avatar to the colors of the Ukraine flag because they thought I was implying that Ukraine was going to be extinct because my avatar is a dinosaur. Uh-oh. <laughs> so. The, the Asgard Archaea, that's what it was. Sorry, not the Loki Archaea. Sorry, I just got that news, and it was a little... I was like, what? Well, okay. Um, yeah, actually, Jackson, you know far more about this section than I do. I, I um, <laughs> My knowledge base is gets smaller and smaller the farther away from Eukaryota you go. Well, you're in luck, because... Next slide, please. Yay! 
Da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, we hit Eukarya. Uh, for any Arkea fans out there, I know we just kind of brushed over them. Big sad. Um, Arkea are weird. Lots of them are like uh, thermophiles and uh, halophiles, and they live in some really weird places. Mm -hmm. Just generally being weird. Or maybe we're the weird ones, because here we are with nuclei and... You know, I mean, look, I, I think I made this point before, but like prokaryotes form the majority of the biomass of the planet. Yeah. Like, so we're the weird ones. Not only are not only are eukaryotes outnumbered by prokaryotes, they're just outmatched. If you put all eukaryotes on one side of a scale and all prokaryotes on the other side of a scale, the prokaryotes would go down and the eukaryotes would go up. So like yeah. eukaryotes, especially multicellular macroscopic eukaryotes mm -hmm. are like a vanishingly small portion of the biosphere when you take a look at the whole thing. Right. It's just that because we're in that section and we interact with it, it's the part that we tend to pay the most attention to. Uh, yes. Um, square root of two points out that you carry are actually included inside the, the Asgard Archeota as of now. So that's cool. So yes. So, it can't so can it even really be called i guess if yeah well i mean i guess it can if all the um all the members of asgard archaeota are uh like monophyletic they're and like sister to eukarya then i guess it would still be fine but i don't know what the uh precise makeup of that clade is right now and i don't think the researchers really do either i mean this group only came out like a few years ago so I, it's this is very cutting edge, or, or that was this very cutting edge of of research. So anyway, there are lots of tiny things that you know are out there in the oceans, and, and we have not found very many of them, comparatively speaking. So, so you carry it. Yeah, uh, agree with Dapper. Yeah, you you carry it. Uh, happen to know a little bit more about. So in a broad sense. You could sort of classify Eukarya into, we'll say, four clades, four big clades. And I'm saying this pedagogically because it's wrong. But in a broad sense, you can sort of classify Eukaryotes into four major clades. One is uh, your excavata. Sorry, I was drawing a blank there for a second, even though it's on the slide. I see that now. Uh, it's going to one... start. <laughs> it's got a star. Uh, one group is your excavata. One group is called Uniconta, and I put that in quotes, or Amorphia. One is your, what is called Chromista, or the, uh, yeah, we'll just go with Chromista. And one is Archiplastida. So those are your, essentially your four major groups. Now, I say essentially because Excavata is probably not monophyletic. It is probably para, if not polyphyletic. Um, and this tree that you're seeing right here is not the most up-to-date tree in the world. Um, the problem with that is if I put any tree up here representing broad eukaryote phylogeny, it's going to be different tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this is... The, the evolutionary tree of life is the most uncertain at the very base and the very tips. In the middle, there's actually pretty like, yeah, we've got a pretty good handle on a lot of that stuff right in the middle. It's really not shifting around very much. But once you get so basal that you're doing a lot of stuff like, um, you know, very long ago evolution and a lot of horizontal gene transfer and stuff, it gets complicated. And then at the very distal ends, you're starting to do stuff like, ah, are these various things like they might be conversion? They might not. It gets hard to tell at those very, mm -hmm. very distal tips. And so here we're at the sort of basal most part of the eukaryote, um, you know, phylogeny. So, yeah, it's it's a little... Uh, that's where it moves around is as a, at the bases yeah. and the tips. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and there is a lot of this moving. I think for instance, like uh, Crypt, Cryptista and Haptista are included among the Chromists nowadays. So Cryptista isn't considered closer to uh, Archiplastids, for instance. And I believe Hemimastigophora nests like sister to Archiplastida. And who knows where the ex Excavata end up, uh, and Sierra Monadita, that's another, that's like, maybe it's near Amorphia? What maybe? we gotta do is we just gotta get um, DNA sequences, full genome sequences for all extant organisms, and that'll help clear it up. Well, 
Yes and no, um, because you can also have like fast evolving regions. Yeah, and, and you can have horizontal gene transfer. It's yeah, I mean, like you know, in some cases, uh, yeah, absolutely, having whole genome sequences can help, but but also having more data isn't always necessarily um, the thing that's going to solve it, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, it depends. It's like a case by case basis, but broadly speaking, yeah, we want more genomes, which gives us more stuff to compare. Uh, cause more data does definitely help over less data. So, um, you guys don't really need to worry about, so, uh, about most of these groups, we're not really going to stay on them for too long. Uh, Excavata, that's like where you have Euglena and some other weird little guys. Uh, funny enough, some, I think it was, uh, Meta Manata was thought to be like a pre mitochondria eukaryote. Didn't it later turn out that they, it seems like they lost the mitochondria? Uh, well, they have sort of neo-functionalized them. They're, they don't look like mitochondria anymore. They're mm. called, like, what is it, mitosomes, I think? Um, and there's one other group that that happened to where it was thought that they they, yeah, they didn't have the mitochondria, but they've just been refunctionalized. Although, fun fact also... Mm. Now, uh, in recent times, it has been found out that there are some ex excavata that don't have mitochondria. So they still lost <laughs> their mitochondria anyways. Um, just, you know, additionally. So fun stuff. And there, there are, there, there's like a, um, there's an Idarian that was also discovered, which doesn't appear to have a mitochondrial genome. It's a member of the, the clade Mixozoa, which are these predominantly fish parasites within Nidaria. So at one point they were thought to be single celled non-animals. They're yeah. really, really, really um, degenerate in the strict sense where they have lost most of the things that you would think of as have as what animals need to have. Mm -hmm. But right. uh, yeah, after their genome was sequenced, it was like, oh, no, no, these are jellyfish. Like, right. Oh, OK, sure. Paleo points out you need to you need all the data before coming to any conclusions. Uh, mm -hmm. as I said, well, I mean, you can having more data is good, but. Having a genome doesn't always necessarily resolve everything, because as pointed out... Well, I think he's uh, got the winky face, because you can never have all of the data. There's always more work to do, but you have to come true. to conclusions. I guess that's true. That's true. Uh, so we... I don't think we really are going to talk about the Chromis too much after this. So they're the SAR group, the Haptista and the Cryptista. Although I think they're really fascinating groups. That's where you have your kelp, diatoms, foraminifera... Um, radiolarians, coccolithophores, those are all within the, the chromist group. It's the chalk group. Yeah, it's the chalk group. Yeah, you know, got lots of cool, a very wide diversity of protists. Also stuff like... Um, Jackson, come on, protists? <laughs> That's not a real thing. Lots of cool little single and multicellular eukaryotes <laughs> distributed across a wide variety of ecologies, you know. Uh, anyway... All right. Hey, when I was when I was in school, protist, protista was still a thing. I okay. I I kind of want to complain because I I took a class in college, a zoology class, where the professor mentioned there were five kingdoms, and I about had a stroke. Oof. So yeah, anyway, that's rough. next slide. <laughs> Origin of multicellularity. So as that picture shows, it occurred a lot. Yeah, there we go. The the bacteria. There are some groups of bacteria with cellular division, but they're generally considered unicellular. So cyanobacteria and actinomyces um since eukaryotes have uh or are making lots of atp which is adenosine triphosphate that is the the essentially the the currency of molecular energy for your cells um because they are uh chugging out way more of this than you know your average bacteria bacterium is capable of doing this allows for them to have organelles even though there is some, there's some debate about that over certain groups of bacteria, but but broadly speaking, you can have a larger genome and organelles and you know cytoskeletons and all kinds of cool stuff because you have more energy, right? You're getting more energy, um, and this allows you to do more, and that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's and, a, it's actually a basic thing about um, like economics, which is yeah. 
it, it basically works for anything where your resources are limited. So there's some kind of scarcity. It happens mm -hmm. in human societies where people specialize for different jobs. It happens in uh, you social organisms like ants and bees where you have different or individual organisms specializing for different tasks that the whole colony needs. And ultimately, it's the same thing that's happening in multicellularity, where you have different cells that are specializing to work at different things, and so they become more efficient at that one thing, and then the entire group gets to benefit from that specialization and that division of labor. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, simple and complex multicellularity has evolved over 20 times in eukaryotes, so green algae, red algae, brown algae. Uh, brown algae is like the kelp. Those guys, Macrocystis, Laminaria, uh, all those dudes. Uh, fungi, animals, etc. Now, so, Jackson, is this tree rooted or unrooted? This is unrooted. Okay. I know that there's been some confusion about that with some people, so I just wanted to make sure that they, they we're clear about that. These cowards should have just rooted it. What are they doing? <laughs> How dare they? Because <laughs> it, it's just a big polytomy where you have excavata down on the bottom. Actually, I only have, see one polytomy. I mean the the tree itself, because it's because you have they're all coming out of the same. Mm, we might have to have a discussion about whether or not that counts as a polytomy later. It's not saying any is more closely related to each other, as I can tell. I mean, it doesn't look like it. Does anyways. matter. It does matter. Okay. Anyways, um, so yeah, multicellularity occurred lots of times uh, in the in organisms in different groups of organisms, probably. You know, within fungi, it probably uh, evolved multiple times. It evolved within uh, chromista multiple times. Um, uh, it evolved within, I think, within like green algae multiple times. So, and it's probably in response to different pressures. It's probably not always the same pressure. When we talked about um, uh, the, the uh, Saccharomyces experiment, uh, in our evolution PowerPoint, um, we discussed how there was you know, selection for, for gravity. We talked about the, or for the ability to settle out faster as a result of gravity. Uh, with the Clementomonas one, we talked about predation. And predation it probably fueled at least some of these. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but there are lots of different environments that organisms can inhabit. And so predation was probably not the only selector. It's probably a variety of things. Anything you'd like to add? Uh, just that is is one of those nodes on the right labeled other? Other straminopiles. Oh, okay, okay. There we go. Got it. <laughs> Diatoms. <Sorry>. All other. <laughs> I was just like, what, what is the other for? <laughs> okay, no, I got it now. Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just not looking at the. That, okay, good. Uh, I was very confused for a second. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, yes, the boring billion. So eukaryotes evolved somewhere between 1.8 and 2 billion years ago. Uh, thereabouts, that's when we have the first, the earliest, like, uh, eukaryotic or probable eukaryotic fossils, which are called acrotarchs. Although I remember now I added a slide about that. So we'll get to that later. Nice multicellularity chart. Can you give me a citation? I, I, like I said, I don't know what I was doing. Why I didn't include citations? Just look up on like Google Images um, evolution of multicellularity, and I can almost guarantee that chart will come up with the associated paper. I, I do apologize. I'm better about I'm normally better about this. Don't know why I didn't include citations for these pictures like I did with the other PowerPoint. My bad. Very disappointed, Jackson. I know. Just take me out back already. Uh, so the boring billion. So uh, about 1.8 billion years ago, the yeah you have the um, supercontinent of Nuna, which lasted from like 1.8 to 1.3 billion years ago, and then Rodinia from about uh, 1.3 to 0.75 billion years ago. And so you have yeah erosion and breakup of Nuna led to trace elements ending up in the oceans, potentially lifting restraints on the evolution of novel features. That was from a paper I read, which I cannot remember the 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 author but i believe it was a recent paper and then um 
I say split about this time. They split the estimates from what I've seen are like about 1.6 billion years ago or so, or yeah, 1.6 to 1.8 billion years ago is when Amoebazoa is thought to have split from Opisthokonta, according to some molecular clocks. So boring refers to, and this was a term that came up or that was invented by a paleontologist, Martin Brazier. I think it's like B-R-A-S-I-E-R -E or Brassier, maybe. <laughs> Um, was he French? I, I don't. I don't think so. That's no. uh, <laughs> and you probably have to pronounce all the letters. <laughs> French is that language where it's like eh, about a third of the letters are probably just not going to get pronounced. Yeah. Um, Dapper, we're gonna. I have to read this comment. Uh, Dapper of Extreme, we're gonna have a little talk later, Mister Jackson. Yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> And we usually do have a little talk afterwards. We do. We do have we have a good chat. We always have fun. Um, so boring refers to the fact that the the chemical content of the ocean and the atmosphere were relatively stable for this time. So uh, which is it's funny because so while the you know the geochemistry was relatively stable, uh, life was undergoing a lot of changes. So whatever erosion was happening, uh, was allowing these trace metals to enter the ocean, and these could have been incorporated into you know, the various organisms that were alive. So evolution was definitely happening. And if you look at molecular clocks, a variety of different, of, like the major groups of organisms, were splitting at, at this time period. You know, in this time period. So you have like you know from the origin of eukaryotes at the beginning to like the origin of animals down towards the end of the boring billion. So lots of evolution occurred. It was not boring for for organisms by any stretch. It was just boring for rocks. Which, uh, isn't it always boring for rocks, basically? I mean, I mean, look, I understand that there are people who are apparently very enthusiastic about rocks, per se. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know what? I'm not going to kink shame. Fair enough. Fair enough. Gotta get your rocks off, I guess. <laughs> I think that's what er erosion is. Oops. Uh, <laughs> literally it's, you're getting the rocks off of whatever <laughs> right that's erosion isn't it i i guess you're right yeah yeah see it all comes back full circle <laughs> next slide please and that means that volcanism is getting your rocks on <laughs> um sr and seawater i that's strontium isn't it sr so i think that's strontium so apparently strontium was doing its own thing during this time period <laughs> Good to know. Um, cannot be contained, become ungovernable, as it were. <laughs> so this chart is backwards. Most of our other charts, they typically start at like uh, whether your start time is is at the, the Y axis and then going outwards. But this is you're uh, getting closer to the Y axis is coming closer to today. Yeah, I don't like it, guys. I, I'm not a big when, fan of it either. When you're putting time on the X axis, the past goes to the left. Yeah, yeah, not a huge fan of this chart, but eh, at any rate. Um, so there you go. Yeah, the boring billion you can see from about 1.8 to 1.8 billion years ago. And there's there's some wiggle room in there. Oh, there's um, a major lubrication event. <laughs> Jackson, I hope you flag this is not appropriate for children. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe I did. Okay, good. Oh, all the, this was all intentional, by the way, folks. Uh, this was all planned in advance, though. Um, oh, oh, so look, so we do have uh, rising continents there somewhere about two and a half billion years. Oh, there you go. <sighs> I like how it's like gig a year. That's that's a fun. That's a that's a fun uh, unit right there. Gig a year. <laughs> gig a year. That's what it is. It says age. G Y R. That's gig a year. That, you're correct. That's what that is. That's a good unit. I should start measuring things in giga years. Like, I'll be there in about uh, 14 times 10 to the negative 8 uh, giga years, give or take. <laughs> Relax, Bayesian molecular clocks for the win. Yep. Um, squishy lid. Yep, squishy lid. All rock stuff. Lubrication, squishy lids. All very important. <laughs> Apparently, the rocks were not bored, despite what Martin Brazier said. <laughs> I mean, they're having squishy lids and major lubrication events, so no, apparently not. Um, 
and also and, and, and new snowball plates. earth oh and snowball yeah and snowball earth which we will i believe there is a slide about that shortly so next slide please <laughs> oh acrotarks yeah uh so um acrotarks the remains of organisms that have yet to be assigned to any particular clade so technically acrotarks could be bacteria or protists or even animals or plants well they um, can't be protists because that's not a thing Wow. Yeah, I'm calling you out on that one, man. <laughs> Good lord. Uh, but they could fall into any of those real or fake groupings of organisms. <laughs> um, because that Acrotark is just a it's just a lace basket. Anything that we don't know yet what it is goes in there, but if you figure out what it is, it goes into whatever clade it It, it was definitely went. alive. We just don't really know how. Yeah. Um, and so some of them like Dictyosphera, Valkyria, and Tapania are almost certainly eukaryotes, so they display degrees of cellular complexity that is comparable to eukaryotes, and so they were probably eukaryotes. And so the oldest eukaryotic acrotarchs come from that formation, which I am not even going to attempt to pronounce, but dates about 1.7 billion years old. So yeah. Uh, anything you want to add? No, I, I think you covered that pretty well. Okay. Next slide, please. I have to say my patented line for these shows. <laughs> uh, fair and balanced, copyright, trademark, restricted. Uh, so we get to our glaciation. So interestingly, uh, prior to, I think it was like within the past 20 years, the cryogenian, which is named for its snowball or slush ball, Earth periods, didn't actually start with those snowball and or slush ball Earths. It started before that. And there was a... a um, or, or geologists kind of got together and were like, hey, since the cryogenian is named for these events, we should probably make it start at the first one. And so they did. Imagine that. <laughs> they were like... We, we yeah. to try and make sense, geologists. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, I appreciate it. I approve. Um, because, uh, what, what is it? Uh, a lot of times, uh, well, when you get into the, the Phanerozoic, which we will next time um periods tend but not always to start and stop with major extinction events yeah it's it's totally arbitrary where you start a period or end it but it's a convenient metric to have it start and end at different major events yeah. right it's, well, because there's just noticeable a... differences in the rocks, right? Whether it be the paleobiota right. that you find or whether it be the actual physical nature of the rocks involved Right. And things like that. So, like for the cryogenian, what's distinctive about it? Well, in terms of geology, you get a lot of things like uh, noticeable, like glacial tills, drop stones from glacial deposits, stuff like that in the rocks from this period, because you know that's what glaciation events do. So there's this period of definitive glaciation. So that's a period, right? You know, yeah, exactly. Same um, thing with uh, like you know the Mesozoic. It's bookended by gigantic extinction events. Right, and typically, well, this, and the end of the Triassic is also, and the start of the Jurassic is also marked by a major extinction event, but yes. interestingly, the Jurassic Cretaceous kind of isn't? No, it's just sort of like, it was a really long span of time, so break it up sometime. Just yeah. Put a line there. There were smaller extinction events, and of course, we'll talk about those way later. Uh, but yeah, for the... In a few billion years, we'll talk about those. <laughs> well, at this point, it's just a couple hundred million years. Oh, so. that's a good point. But yeah, yeah, we'll get we'll get there in a couple hundred million years. So stay tuned. So like 0. 0.2 giga years. <laughs> it's my new I favorite can't... unit of time is the giga year. <laughs> um, so these, um, so if I remember correctly, what trigger these these uh, these snowball Earth events is you basically have all of your land masses in super in these supercontinents. Now a supercontinent doesn't necessarily mean all of your <clears throat> all of your land masses are together because uh, the Europe, Asia, and Africa also form a supercontinent because they're all connected. But obviously, not all of the continents are part of that. <clears throat> However, with Rodinia, that wasn't the case. It was this one big continuous landmass. And it ended up sort of at the, the equatorial regions, and this resulted in lots of erosion, which an erosion uh sucks CO2, carbon dioxide, out of the atmosphere. And remember, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, so it has a tendency to trap heat in the atmosphere, yes. which, you know, is a good thing. Uh, we got to have some heat on this this planet or else we just freeze. 
but too like much. all things, it's a it's a moderation thing. Right. Exactly. And so, uh, and so, as this carbon dioxide is being sucked, is being majorly sucked out of the the atmosphere, this is causing cooling. So lots and lots of it is exiting the atmosphere, and this is dropping the temperature of the Earth, and this is what caused the snowball, or the snowball or slush ball, because. Uh, I think more recent research has shown that it probably wasn't totally iced over. Uh, probably equatorial regions had open water. So, uh, but still really cold. Pretty much, darn cold. Much, much colder than the last glacial maximum. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and animals probably evolved yeah, during or just before the start of this period. Somewhere between like you know, maybe 800 million years, 720 million years ago. Go animals. Yeah, which were probably like sponges. Yeah, the animals at this time would not have been much that you would recognize as an actual uh, animal. Like, probably none of them really were at motile as adults. And, mm. you know, they were all probably like suspension feeding and whatnot. Right. Yeah, exactly. All right. Next slide, please. But they had cholesterol. That's true. They they did have those, uh, those steranes, which I think think I have a slide where I talk about that. If not, we definitely will bring it up. Later. Nice. Because um, I have Barella, some Dickinsonia. Some I've come there. around on that point. Oh, yeah. So the Ediacaran. Yeah. Oh, well, again, we'll, we'll explain it in a minute. Um, so the Ediacaran. <clears throat> this is the final period of the Neoproterozoic before we get to the Phanerozoic, which is the Cambrian to today. Uh, so the Ediacaran lasted from 635 to 542 million years ago. And it is in this period that we see the first macroscopic life there's lots of microscopic fossils prior but the first macroscopic organisms appear here and at the beginning you get what's called the avalon explosion which is where you see uh those weird little frond like guys which you can see in the back of this picture they're red things like uh charnia so these weird little frond guys which uh, i believe are based on recent analyses considered to be like stem eumetazoans so that's interesting. Yeah, uh, we know that they're not photosynthetic because they're generally yes. found in deep water deposits where there wouldn't have been light. So yeah. despite looking like a uh, like a fern uh, branch or something, they weren't photosynthesizing. So currently we're thinking that maybe they were uh, filtering particles out of the water or mm -hmm. maybe they were just uh, passively absorbing various um, minerals and whatnot that were dissolved in the water and then using those to power a very slow metabolism. Right. Yeah, and uh, there are some guys out there, some paleontol, some like actual legitimate paleontologists. Uh, it's a very, very small group, though. Like Greg Retallick. Um, who... It's so small we can name him. <laughs> like he's still putting out papers, you know, that get cited. Um, yeah, not as much I think anymore, but um, he's still out there doing stuff. He's still you know excavating and whatnot. Um, who claims that a lot of the Ediacaran deposits are, in fact, uh, like terrestrial deposits? And, yeah. Uh, mm. No, just no, they're not. They're not. Mm -mm. Um, I think whatever sedimentological arguments he first sort of offered have been kind of debunked, and he's still sort of pushing it for some things, and it's like, no, they were marine. These were marine depositional environments, and these are marine organisms. Yeah. So... <clears throat> Uh, kind of, it's sort of, I, I don't think he's quite, well, maybe he is, I don't know. Um, I'm not. I mean, we're finding them in things <laughs> like, like shale and stuff. Like these, these aren't being found in like alien sandstone or something. Right. I found a fossil sea pen before. Very nice. That's nice. Yeah. Really cool. There was actually a thinking, uh, and Paleologo said that, there was thinking briefly that Charnia was in fact a sea pen or some other Nidarian, but that yeah. turned out to be false because it's a fractal. It is not built like sea pens are, or any Nidarian, or any organism alive today, really. Yeah, we don't really have fractal uh, animals anymore. You could, Which There's an sad. argument for plants being fractal, um, like some of them at least. Okay. Like to some extent, because branching patterns are well approximated by various pra uh, fractal patterns mathematically. Mm. Um, but not animals. So, whereas we get a lot of fractal growth in the, the Precambrian, where we get this branches that have branches that have branches all in things that are apparently animals uh yeah. you also get what's called glide symmetry i don't know if you're going to talk about that no go ahead so glide symmetry is it's sort of like having segmentation 
but instead of having a segment that goes across the body, you know, uh, laterally, each quote unquote segment, it's called an isomer, is actually sort of sort of shifted up. So um, if you look at, I don't know, do you have a better a better picture of like the consonia there? Uh, yeah, a little bit later. Oh, well, okay. if you if you want to bring this up later, I guess you can. Yeah, so we'll talk more about glide symmetry when we get a better picture of Dickinsonia, because Dickinsonia is an animal that displays it pretty well. And I say animal because I do believe that was actually one of the the um, the taxa for which like uh, molecular remnants of cholesterols were discovered. Uh, that's one of them. Yeah, um, yeah which makes it a very definitive animal. Yes. Yeah. Because um, plants don't well, have cholesterol. Right, and not just any cholesterol, but like animal specific cholesterols. Yeah. So there are like some, you'll find like your aberrant protists that may make like some kind of cholesterol or something. Except but like, you won't, because those don't exist. <laughs> Jackson, you're going to have to stop saying protist, it. man, or I'm going to bring it up every time. Uh, there was also an increase in oxygen levels towards the end of this period, which is implicated in some of the um, hypotheses about like the the evolutionary arms races in this time period because this is when you also first see the evidence of predation you find like boreholes in cloudina shells and things like that so mm -hmm. somebody was uh was getting some cloudina meat yum just digging on in there tasty stuff which are also apparently annelids now oh which kind of cool interesting i did not know that yeah a paper came out i think on that last year i could be wrong but i believe that came out I'd and Tully Monstrum is apparently a vertebrate. Uh, I have, I've heard, yeah, I've heard that. Uh, I mean, I guess I wouldn't be surprised, but it's a weird dude. Anyway, I was, I was holding out for uh, mollusk, but whatever. Yeah. Well, we all face disappointments in life, my dinosaur friend. Next yeah. slide, please. And Tully Monstrum not being a mollusk is just one of them. Precambrian biota. So here are some um, non animals. Uh, you got Orosphera duraldiae, which is a fungus. The earliest uh, uh, fossil fungus dated to one billion years ago. Mangiomorpha, a red algae. Um, now, I put Mangio Mangiomorpha here, but actually there is an older red algae that has been discovered from 1.6 billion years ago, and it's called Raphatasmia. I believe it was discovered in India. Nice. But yeah, again, these are these guys are microscopic. Uh, it, says, it says, what does that say? 25 micrometers, I think? Very tiny. Uh, yeah, that does say 25 micrometers. So yeah, real small, real small guys. And then testate amoeba, 742 million years ago. So that's, um, so that's that's Tony, and that's even prior to the cryogenian period. So yeah, uh, which also makes sense given what the the molecular clocks we talked about earlier. Then Megasphera is also technically an acrotarch because it's a multicellular eukaryote, but isn't assigned to any particular. Um, uh clade there are and this is from a oh dang i'm drawing a blank i can't remember the name of the biota but it was discovered back in 98 i believe and this is one of those fossils where the researchers were like i think this is an animal embryo and some of the uh, alleged embryos from this fossil site are probably animal embryos because they apparently exhibit um enough diversity in their cell types that they that, that this is only like comparable to animals so mm. so yeah next slide well, there please. you go there you go there you have it folks archaeoplastida okay so here we are talking about uh plants again um so archaeoplastida is broken into three groups you have viridi plantae which are the green algae rhodophyta rhodo means red so the red algae and then glaucophyta uh, we don't really talk about the glaucophyta. They're called the blue-green algae or green-blue algae, whatever, but it, it, so few people even know what those are. It's not even really worth discussing. So I petitioned to change the common name to the Gru algae. <laughs> Gru is a technical term, Jackson. Okay. It Alrighty. is. It's um, not biology yet. <laughs> I believe it. Um, so again, you know... Uh, the secondary endosymbiotic event, which the eukaryote incorporated a, a cyanobacterium, which became the chloroplast that occurred prior to the evolution of, of these guys. And then you get your split, uh, your red algae. Uh, if you like sushi, you eat red algae. That's called porphyra, which makes the wrap. Or it's delicious. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good stuff. Um, 
there are lots of different types of red algae. Um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, urchins like eating red algae, as well as kelp, which is a brown algae, so very distantly related. Um, and then the green algae are, I believe, uh, next slide, please. I believe I go into more detail on them. Yes. Uh, well, sort of. Um, so this is chlamydomonas. The, the little picture is a, a, a micros microscope photo down on the bottom left. So chlamydomonas is sort of like what you could say the, the quote, ancestor of plants would have looked like. He's just a little, little green guy with two flagella. And so their life cycle is pretty simple. He exhibits what, as we discussed in the evolution PowerPoint, a zygotic life cycle or a haplontic life cycle. So in essence, you have you are haploid for the vast majority of your life, even if that isn't a very long life, uh, developmentally speaking. Um, you are the only time you are diploid is when you're a zygote, when two gametes come together you know, uh, the and there's it's not even really like which is male which is female at this point it's just which is the it's opposite two of them yeah which is the opposite type yeah mating type it's called a mating type yeah so there you go sorry oh yeah no and uh um we don't talk about fungi really but fungi can have like hundreds of mating types <laughs> yeah um it turns out sexual reproduction is way more complicated than male and female yeah and there's a, a whole lot of variation within the umbrella of sexual reproduction. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is probably what the ancestor of plants would have been doing. Just, just a little biflagellate photosynthesizing and reproducing every so often. Uh, but as we showed in the evolution PowerPoint, they can actually be induced uh, through successive generations to become multicellular. So that's kind of cool under you know certain uh predatory pressures anything you'd like to add well now that i'm unmuted uh i think you did a very good job covering that oh thanks. but also your slide does say on a flagellated protest which is impossible next slide please okay so within veridi plantae um so your uh or so we were looking at chlamydomonas so chlamydomonas is unicellular and from there you can you know stack if you just stack cells on top of each other you get a filament of cells or in the case of volvox you get you turn them into a little sphere all right um put make make a little jelly that kind of holds everybody together and you become a little sphere of essentially chlamydomonas all together this is Proteraclitus, this guy on the top right, uh, which is a, a little filamentous algae from the Precambrian. Um, and there are still lots, of, lots and lots and lots of filamentous algae out there today. That's Spirogyra down there on the bottom, on the bottom right, called Spirogyra because here's the thing. The chloroplasts form a spiral. Crazy world. Um, yeah. Is it a spiral or is it a helix? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, on the bottom. Um, uh, so you can be a little, you can stack, uh, your little chlamydomonas on top of each other and get a, um, a filament, or you can put them together and make a little, uh, a sphere and you get like a volvox. Um, and so all those guys you see on the bottom, Clementomonas, Gonium, Uterina, Pleurina, Volvox, those are all alive today. Now, that's not a true phylogeny of them right there, uh, because some of those are more closely related to each other than others. You know, you may get like, um, maybe Gonium is like more closely related to Volvox or something like that than to the others. So that's not a phylogeny. That's just showing in terms of what exists today, what the possible steps could have been. You also get this cool thing as you get like more complex, uh, you add more cells and do more like division of labor. You go from being isogamous where your gametes are virtually identical towards anisogamy where you start to have uh, differences between them. Your egg cells get, you know, larger, for instance, than your your sperm cells to oogamy 
where you have very, very different gametes. That's what animals are. We're oogametic because the egg cells are not motile, whereas our, you know, and they're way, way bigger than our sperm cells. So, um, and then this phylogeny of, of already plantae. So you see land, land plants, quote, quote, this is the, this, the technical name for that is embryophyta because they form an embryo. Although there are some, some uh, other streptophytes, which are closely related to them, called the carophytes, and some of them also do similar things. So basically, the big difference in embryophytes from the others is these other guys release their gametes into the water, basically, and, and they come together. Whereas uh, your land plants, you have your... your uh, actually, I think it's on the next slide, uh, I believe. Can we go to the next slide, please? I think I explained this there. No, I didn't. I... <laughs> oh, well, I don't know what I was doing. We'll get back to this, the reproduction thing in a second. Um, another way you could do it is you just make a whole sheet of cells, and that's basically what ulva is. So ulva is also is uh, multicellular, right? But its gametes still look like little chlamydomonas. So you have your haploid gametes up there in the top right, which infuse uh to form a zygote which then grows into a sporophyte so that is your your diploid uh form which then makes spores it undergoes meiosis to form haploid spores and then those haploid spores undergo mitosis to form gametophytes so a sporophyte makes spores and a gametophyte makes gametes this is true not just for for ulva, but also for the embryo for the embryophytes. The same thing is true of you know, your mosses and your ferns and flowers. It's, it's all the same. It's just you're changing how long each of these processes occurs, basically. <clears throat> uh, anything you'd like to add on this point? I know. I think you covered it quite well. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, in essence, uh, basically, you there are lots of different ways of m going multicellular for for plants. You can be like just a little blob of cells, uh, or you can be a filament, or you can be a sheet. But basically, all you're doing is you're just like stacking your cells. Essentially, you're connecting them in some very simple way. So these, these guys are not like, you know, it's not super complex. It's it's just your filaments. I mean, they're certainly more complex than like Chlamydomonas is, but it's just a matter of you're not um, you're not re you know you're not inventing the wheel, not reinventing the wheel. You are changing what already exists for new purposes, and that was something we tried to impart in our evolution slideshow. Was that it's you're not always you don't have to make new genes for everything. You can keep your genes. You may duplicate them and then mutate those. But it's homologs of the same genes. Mm -hmm. So, also horsetails are cool. Indeed, horsetails are cool. They used to be much more prominent during the Mesozoic, and they were much much bigger in some cases, not in all cases. Um, <laughs> just saying because you got one up there. Benthoven says, <laughs> "I used to have fewer cells." That's that's true. true. Yeah. And then one day you will have fewer cells again. So. Yeah. Take pride in that fact, I guess. Well, I feel like the uh, number of cells in an adult human tends to vary through time. Wait, did you say a horsetail was up here? Yeah, is that, is that not no, a No, that's not a horsetail. That's Kara. That's an algae. I'm sorry, I wasn't... Darn I was, it. I was I'm reading the, the, the... It looks like a horsetail. Kind of, yeah. I'm sorry, I was reading the comments. I, I was... Uh... Sorry, my bad. Um, I could have yeah, said Cara... anything. Yeah. You would have just been like, yeah, yeah, sure, Dapper. It took me a moment. I know I'm, I've become Joe Rogan, basically. I could have been um, like, "Oh yeah, Protus, it's totally a thing." Like, you know, I've, I've heard this thing said, and Snails people are, are saying it, zones. and uh, and you're telling me it's true, so it must be. I'm not <laughs> saying it is true. I'm saying people should do their own research. Yeah, That's, I'm yeah. just asking questions. <laughs> no shade thrown, of course. Um, anyway, no, some shade thrown. <laughs> I'm I'm okay with throwing some shade. Um, so the cool, so the, the cool thing is Kara represents a very significant step towards the embryophytes, the land plants. And 
the that very significant step is you keep is your your uh, embryo develops on you rather than somewhere else so instead of releasing your gametes to the ocean or river or what have you you're keeping them on you and so you get fertilized basically and then uh you can form you know uh so you have yeah these these are uh, the ogonium and then that forms uh your uh, zygote and then you release your zygote basically instead of just releasing the gametes and so we'll get into more of this um a little bit later once we finally meet the land plants but you can see their reproductive strategy was uh was or is you know predicated on these other um these other these algae which are definitely not land plants so you're like i said you're just you're it's steps towards um complexity it's not all in one go so they make your, your antheridium which has your sperm cells, your oogonium, which makes your, your egg cells, and then your the egg cell gets fertilized, and then that forms your your uh, zygote. So yeah. And then your zygote gets released. Next slide, please. Unless you have something to add, Dapper? No, I think you covered that quite well. Okay, holozoa. Yay. So we are bouncing all the way back from plants and algae to uh much closer to animals now yeah so we kind of skipped amoebozoans sorry amoebozoa fans out there apologies wait you mean we didn't evolve from amoebas we evolved from amoeba-esque organisms I guess. but not actual amoebas not not members of the clade amoebozoa no hmm. sorry take take note everybody <laughs> You, we just evolved from pond scum. Goo to zoo to you. Um, at least it rhymes. I like it. It does rhyme. Gotta give them that. Look at this. I cited a source for once. Go Jax. <laughs> well done. I I know. I, I appreciate it. Uh, so Holozoa is the clade, or well, sorry, Opisthoconta is the clade that includes fungi, ichthyosporia, philisteria, conoflagellata, and metazoa. That's the animals. And Within that clade, holozoa is basically all those guys minus fungi. Get out of here, mushrooms. Exactly. You and your favorite yeast. Cell wall. Oh, well, yeah. So that is my favorite fungi or fungus. Yeah. Saccharomyces cerevisiae. <laughs> what? Uh, this, this little guy right here. There's nothing also... funny about Saccharomyces. <laughs> Jackson will just laugh at anything I say as long as I say it in the right tone, is basically what happens. That's, that's not incorrect. Yeah. Uh, I think I laughed at the the drinking rules like every time you said them. So every time so far, yeah. Uh I still think tells a joke that doesn't land is the funniest one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because it makes it land for us. No, wait. There's also the what's the other one? Um, tells a joke that doesn't land, and oh, like. That definitely didn't happen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Stories that didn't happen. By the way, in case anyone isn't familiar, these are the drinking rules that I have for my Tuesday shows where myself and a guest uh, talk about a creationist video where the creationist involved has some kind of pun relationship with their name to my guest's name. So with Jackson Wheat, we talk about Dr. Charles Jackson. Mm -hmm. And with uh, Ben Hoven here, we talk about Kent Hoven. And uh, we also do an Eric Hoven with Erica Guts a Gibbon. Mm -hmm. and a uh, Matt with Maddie, and there's two Matts. So we were on Matt Powell first, and then we switched over to Raw Matt. I think Maddie <laughs> drew the short stick on that one. Sorry, Maddie. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, that's... <laughs> that pole, you, you get Charles Jackson, that's leagues above either yeah. Matt. Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. And it's still really bad, even with Charles Jackson. So anyway, that's enough shilling for my channel. Let's talk about Ichthyosporia or something. Yes, um... So, uh, Holozoa, so this clade, and this little guy, uh, Bicellum Bice brazieri from Scotland, is apparently the oldest known uh, Holozoan, so it dates to a billion years ago. So that's pretty That's cool. a whole gig a year. <laughs> that is one gig a year, yes. Next slide, please. Okay, I guess we'll just, yeah. Okay, so, uh, Ichthyosporia, Philisteria, um, 
not a super lot to say about them. Ichthyosporia includes like some fish parasites, hence Ichthyo. Um, they also used to go by this name called uh, Drips, which referred to it was like an acronym for the the members. Uh, I can't remember there. I think R was Rosette Agent, which was like they diagnosed it before they knew what it was or like had a genus or whatever. So it was what caused you know, this. So <clears throat> so it used to be called Drips or uh, Mesomycetozoa is the other name for it. But Ichthyosporia sounds cooler in my opinion. And then um, Philisteria. So both of these clades have members who are who can like do... Um, or no, actually, I think they're both. Uh, are they both uh, unicellular, or do does either of them do multicellularity? I don't think so. I think they're I both mean, unicellular. I, I'm pretty sure everything on this in this section is um, unicellular, except for animals and some fungi. I think you're right. So yeah, and then um, some of them are so, colonial, though. Yes. Yeah. Um, like a lot of coanoflagellates are, are colonial. Yeah, we get to coanozoa. So uh, a coana. Uh, is is a these are um, like a collar, so you have these um, villi, and they form a little collar around a central flagellum. And if I remember correctly, there's not really a huge difference between villi and flagellum, right? The villi are tiny. I mean, yeah, but it's like the same structure, isn't it? Yeah, as far as I know, it's it's very similar. Um, yeah, they're. I mean, it's like. When does the cilia become big enough to stop being a cilium? I don't know. Right. Oh, sorry, I should have said I should have said cilia, not villi. My bad. Yeah, villi uh, are what you got in your lungs. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry. Cilia. Cilia. Sorry. Not not villi. Um, yeah, I don't think there's much of a difference in terms of of like a microstructure between cilia and flagella. I don't think. Uh, if I'm wrong, someone point it out in the chat, please. Um, yes, Yellow Jackson. Please do. I love it. Uh, so there's, um, so interestingly, we are, well, um, like sponges, for instance, have, um, what are called coanocytes, which are these cells that look a lot like coanoflagellates. They have sort of the same, or a lot of the same microstructure. Um, are they convergently evolved or are these the remnants of coanoflagellates? Well, there's a bit of a debate, but I mean, I really wouldn't be surprised if it turns out they are in fact, um, sort of homologs of yeah, but, I mean, there, It's one of those things where, like, it could go either way, but the it looks suspiciously similar, so there's a, a fair chance that there's, you know, homology there. Yeah. Um, this other... Dang, uh, I forgot to <laughs> do it for this paper. Um, so this picture comes from my recent paper, which I think came out last year, which is about um, how... Uh, the the coenoflagellates have their uh, their vesicular system, which kind of is uh, is or centralizes at their poles basically, and that's sort of similar to how like um, like nerve cells work and things like that. And so maybe have this this um, method of having your your secretory vesicles at like the poles of a cell, maybe that was also accepted and that came to be used for like synapses. And yeah, maybe it did. You know, that's entirely possible. Um, all it takes. And so as you can see in this picture, it's like you have your colonial cells coming together. And well, we already know that coenoflagellates will um, change their like orientation as a group in response to certain stimuli. So it's not crazy, I think. It sounds like a reasonable hypothesis to me, but not a coenoflagellate expert. That would be Nicole King. So if you uh, have not read any of papers, me. go do that. <clears throat> Next slide, please. I think we're pretty close to the end, so we can probably finish this up. Uh, Eosyatha spongia, maybe a sponge. It's definitely sponge grade, uh, but it's like, uh, I think the early Ediacaran, something like that. Haotia, definitely a Nidarian. There's been like zero argument that Haotia is a Nidarian. Uh, I think it's like even a crown Nidarian, which is kind of interesting. 
than Dickinsonia, so a STEM Balaturian. And we were talking about glide symmetry earlier, so feel free. Yes. So the thing with glide symmetry, and you can actually see it here if you look very closely uh, to the, at this Dickinsonia picture, um, it has these little things that look like segments on either side. But if you look closely, they don't actually line up one to one. Each one is sort of at the the medial most point is right sandwiched between two other isomers. And that's what that glide symmetry is like. So it's like it's been shifted, it's sort of like bricks, right? If you have like um, if you look at bricks on a wall and you look at just two rows of bricks, each one is usually offset by like half a distance of a brick. And that's similar to how glide symmetry is working. And so in a lot of these um, Precambrian animals, we're seeing glide symmetry. You also see it in uh, Charnia. And that is distinctly different from the true bilateral symmetry that we get with things like Ikaria and, you know, you or me, where both sides are actually directly mirrored. And uh, it's not clear if one of those is ancestral to the other or if they were um, independently evolved or what. It's still sort of up in the air. Um, it's for one thing, it's, we don't know the genetic basis for um, this kind of glide symmetry with isomers because we don't have any extant isomer, um, isomerically symmetrical or glide symmetrical animals. And so all we have to go on is the fossils. And that's Precambrian fossils are already hard enough to come by. So, Absolutely correct. Um, that other little guy down there who's... I think only like a couple centimeters long, something like, or a couple millimeters long, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, centimeters uh, is uh, pretty generous. Yeah, no, I think it's only a couple of millimeters. Uh, that's uh, Ikaria lariutia. So a little bilaterian. Uh, so in the in the Ediacaran, that's where all these guys are from. You have like your earliest, um, well, the earliest probable evidence of animals, it comes from... Uh, Steranes in the cryogenian so there's been a bit of an argument because there are these rocks from oman which have these steranes in them which um are known from two groups of organisms one is sponges and the other is like in very minute quantities from a type of of algae and um <clears throat> and so these researchers uh, who were looking at these rocks and doing these geochemical analyses. Yes, yeah, I, I figured we were pretty close to the end. Um, they were doing these geochemical analyses, and they found that there were large quantities of these steranes, and so what that seemed to indicate to them was that there were sponges here. And the reason they think it was the sponges, not the, the pelagified algae, is that the algae give off the, these sterane compounds as an accidental byproduct of a different metabolic pathway. And so you'd expect very low quantities of it if that were the case. But in fact, the quantities of, of the sterines match that for sponges rather than for the algae because the researchers tested that because that's what you do. You rule out hypotheses that could potentially kneecap your argument. Um, and there's been a lot of back and forth over this. Uh, there was arguing, there was argument that maybe the these like bacteria associated with sponges make it, but turns out they don't have any of the genes involved in that metabolic process. Then there is an argument that um, there are some groups of chromists who make like the precursors of these molecules, but a precursor is not the same thing as the actual molecules. So that argument has kind of gone by the wayside. And one guy tried uh, making the argument that you could synthesize the these, um, or you could generate these compounds via uh, abiotic conditions however the conditions he used are not found like on earth or in the ocean so <laughs> um you know not uh, not super relevant but anyways so well they were abiotic uh, elements brought to earth by aliens sure so they were like possibly. abiotic but you know the aliens brought them here just to trick people billions of years later and they were I very mean, tricks why to the aliens yeah maybe <laughs> Why not? Um, so, so I I tend to agree that probably the steranes are indicative of sponge activity, which again, or sponge given... inactivity since they don't do much. <laughs> but I mean, since you know animals probably originated about eight hundred million years ago, again that doesn't fall outside of the timeline since it was like seven hundred million years ago. That still falls within the probable range of animals. So, eh, okay. Next slide, please. 
couple more. So now we're actually into the 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 crown bilaterians. So you have Kimberella, which is a Lophotrochozoan. I didn't put mollusk because there is some debate over that. Is it a yeah. mollusk? Is it a stem mollusk? Is it a stem Lophotrochozoan? Well, eh. Um, it's what happens when you're dealing with you know organisms that are millimeters across? It certainly is what you would expect. Uh, a, something that's like karyotypic of the common ancestor of mollusks to look like. Sure. Yeah. It has uh, sort of the most generalized mollusk type body that you can imagine. Yeah. It was also like a, a soft sort of biomineralized uh, little shell on its back rather than a, a tough like calcium shell or something. So, um, so yeah, it, it you know, some kind of lophotrochozoan, maybe a, a stem mollusk, but uh uh, certainly not, a, certainly not a cloud, a stem bird, though. Definitely not a stem bird. Probably not. Yeah, unlike I, pterosaurs. I, I put some. Uh, ooh, Namacalathus is a is probably a, a stem lophophorate. So lophophorata is the clade that includes brachiopods, foranita, and bryozoa. Um, and so this little guy seems to have some of the characteristics that they have. So this pushes their clade back into the late Ediacaran. Claudina seems to be an annelid based on some recent analyses of like possible uh, preserved gut. So that's kind of cool. And Eulingia, well, I put panarthropod, but Eulingia could also just be an annelid, although it has these little trilobe segments, which are kind of like trilobites. So that's neat, uh, which is why it has is maybe panarthropod affinity. But uh, the A in abiotic stands for aliens. Yes, it does. Alien biotic. It specifically was the aliens from the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, The Chase. Fun fact. I'm glad we know which ones it was. Oh, uh, yeah. Next slide, please. I mean, they left us a little, like, uh, holographic video message you know, in, a, in the DNA of numerous species across the galaxy. So. Nice. Very nice. I, I knew it wasn't all junk DNA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of it's part of a videotape. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I mean, we're at the we're at the two hour mark anyway. So, also, yeah. So this is from Evans at all, twenty twenty one. Yay! I got two. Good job, Jackson. Proud of you. High five to yourself. Um, so these are all Ediacaran fossils. You got Tribrachidium, uh, which is this weird sort of triradial guy, who seems to be sort of like a basal uh, eumetazoan or, or a stem eumetazoan. Uh, Dickinsonia is like a stem bilaterian. Icaria is a bilaterian. And then Kimberella is a Lophotrochozoan. So you can see the sort of stepwise acquisition of characters in these different clades, or, you know, these different fossils, uh, indicating that they are members of different clades. So you have a diversity of organisms that is starting to appear before the Cambrian. Hoo hoo. Which is like exactly what you expect under evolution. Crazy stuff. I don't know. I mean, it's certainly crazy that we even found these things because you remember that it was not that long ago that the Cambrian had the earliest known fossils. Yes. Yeah, I think it was only the 1960s was when uh, researchers were starting to be like, oh, hey, these guys are from the before the Cambrian. These fossils yeah. date to the pre-Cambrian. And yeah, so that was pretty recent. Um, when Darwin was around, you know, the he thought the Silurian was the lowest layer. Yeah, you know, the geologic column. So, you know, that was 160 years ago. So in a very short time, we've come pretty far in terms of our understanding of the history of Earth. And we still got a long way to go. Oh, yeah. We're going to make all sorts of new discoveries. Yep. OK, well, that is the end of this slide. Do you have anything to add, Dapper? Um, I just really like Kimberello. Kimberello is a cool fossil. Yeah. Not going to lie. Um, I do you have anything? An aquarium. <laughs> do you? No, uh, I would. I would. Oh, if, you would. I thought if, you said if you I could. <laughs> no, I can't because they're all gone. Yeah. Um, so, do you have anything to promote, my fair dinosaur? Oh, sure. I got plenty of stuff. So let's see. Uh, let me open up a calendar here. Um, uh, so, uh, let's see. Friday, I actually have something that's not mine, but um, the Creation Myths channel, which is a friend of ours. It's going to be mm -hmm. uh, having a review of the 
new book Traced by Nathaniel Jensen. Oh, yes. Which purports absolutely. to be able to use Y chromosome haplogroups to trace back all of humanity to the three sons of Noah. Which, spoiler alerts, uh, no, no, it can't. Um, <laughs> it is it is like, uh, it would be a nice effort for like a 12-year-old's first phylogeny. <laughs> Um, so that's on Friday. I actually don't know exactly what time, unfortunately, um, I don't remember, but Saturday at noon Pacific, 3 PM Eastern, I'm going to be talking about, uh, North American giants again, what's going to be part four of who knows how many, um, then Tuesday, the 12th should be an Eric with Erica. So if you like guts a given, I should be live with her at, um, should be six Eastern nine, sorry, six Pacific nine Eastern. Um, although I will double check with her to make sure that that works because I do think that's slightly different time than the last time for her, but not for me because we don't change clocks here. Um, then on the 14th, there should be the next episode of Dapper Goes to Church Show where Pastor Carl Kirby preaches about fossils to me. And it's, if, yeah, it's a thing. Nice. Um, <clears throat> I don't actually have anything set up for the 16th, but I'm tr thinking about trying to get uh, Bread of Life on the channel to talk about the evolution of sexual reproduction. Because she made a video on her examining evolution channel, where I, I don't I don't really understand what her objections were. So I want to talk. To, the first thing I want to establish is like, what is she actually uh, saying? Because I I watched the video and I I wasn't exactly sure what the argument was. So hopefully we can get that done on the sixteenth. Um, but you know that's going to be up to her schedule, and we haven't really uh, gone anything past just the yeah we should set something up stage. Then um, the nineteenth will be a Matt with Maddie. The 21st should be uh, the upload of the, you know, super cut of my uh, uh, Andrew Snelling is a Liar series. It's basically a two-hour super cut of me pointing out how fundamentally dishonest and knowingly dishonest uh, Snelling is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have anything planned for the 23rd currently. The 26th, Jackson. With Jackson is the plan. And Jackson. Uh, well, I don't know. You can go to Jackson if you want. I'm not going to Jackson. <laughs> um, and then uh, let's see. I think the 28th starts my two-part series uh, called Kurt Unwise, in which Kurt Wise tells me that I'm a coward for thinking that giraffoidea is a thing instead of just lumping pronghorns into either uh, bovidae or cervidae. Because that's how that works. Yes. I'm a hey, Jackson, if you think that's how it works, you're a coward. If you think the giraffoidea is a thing... There's giraffidae, cervidae, and bovidae. We're not going to talk about muscoidae. Or mus musco muscoidae? I don't know. It's the musk deer. We're not going to talk about them. They don't count. Wasn't? Aren't there like? What about all those? Uh, was it synthetocerids? All those guys? Shh. Aren't those like pronghorn don't, relatives or something? Shh, don't talk about those. <laughs> bovidae or cervidae, Jackson. Those are your only options since it's well, clearly it not a giraffe. <laughs> just like all ruminants are just deer or cow yep also um if the red panda isn't a bear or an actual procyonid <laughs> you're a coward no i Lurine does not is is not an option no not Did he say that too yeah. yeah oh god that's yeah. amazing kurt wise is just like my goodness man uh <laughs> imagine scientists taking seriously the possibility that things might be a little bit more complicated than bovidae or cervidae or you know, Ursa Day or Procyon Day. Only options. Oof. Yeah. Oof. Oh, he also, despite showing a figure from a paper about Ilurid evolution, talking about <laughs> fossil Ilurid taxa, still <laughs> maintains that it's either Procyon Day or Ursa Day. You get a pick. Big yikes. Yeah. So wait, does he have so. a thing against like monotypic taxa in general? Is he just like, that can't happen? No, man, he doesn't have a thing. He just has whatever sounds good at the time. Okay. There's no consistency to this. This like his he's not like ginkgos. I don't think so. <laughs> no, he. As far as I can tell, he just looks at things about which there have been um, like taxonomic debates in the past, mm -hmm. and then says, "Ha, wh where does this belong?" And then I come and say, "Well, it's here. We, this is a settled issue now." <laughs> like I'm happy that like in the 1920s, it wasn't clear exactly what to do with the red panda. But that was 100 years ago, man. We know. Oof. Yeah. Big yikes. Is yeah. is uh is the video? Oh, never mind. Uh, uh, 
If you want to watch it now, you can. You just have to join the Patreon or there go. channel memberships. So there you go. It's up for early. There is currently, I think, like ten videos up for early access on there. <laughs> yeah, are, are some of those our <laughs> our chats or? Uh... Uh, no, I don't put those up for uh, early access. Okay, fair enough. Because I figure, you know what? If someone wants to watch our chats, and I haven't mirrored it, they should yeah. go to your channel. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Alrighty. Uh, well, thank you for coming uh mr uh, dapper dinosaur and uh, thank you peter for hosting as always thank you everybody in the audience for being here uh in our next show we will start the fanerzoic so we'll the we'll do the paleozoic and i have i don't th i don't think we'll get through that one in one go we were kind of zooming with this one i think we went through like two billion years of evolutionary history in about 30 minutes so you know yeah it happens yeah. anyway Alrighty. Uh, well, thanks everybody for watching and we will see you all next time.